1995 Chevy S10 with a 4.3 liter engine. VIN W is the engine code. Uh, customer complaint mainly is a long crank time and he needs to hold the pedal to the floor to get the car to start. Um, also we have a check engine light on and another symptom is a little bit of a rough idle and very poor gas mileage. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to our scan data and we're going to check our trouble codes. Alright, here's our trouble codes for this car. We have a PO172, which is fuel system 2 rich, bank 1. And we also have a PO300 trouble code. Uh, I believe these are related. Uh, it's kind of strange that this PO300 is coming and going here. I'm not too worried about that. Our main concern is this 172 fuel system too rich. So the next thing we're going to do with this code is we're going to look at our fuel trim numbers. What we want to do now is uh, we want to let this engine warm up a little bit. Fuel trim numbers aren't really relevant when the engine's in open loop. We want this thing to go into closed loop. And really it's going to be when this oxygen sensor starts to fluctuate is how we'll be able to tell that it went into closed loop. And also when our short term fuel trim becomes active as it has and you see we're already going negative on the short term. So we're negative 20, still climbing. Negative 32, negative 35, negative 40. This is a really bad rich condition as noted by the O2. And one of the things that you'd have to be concerned about with this O2 is, is this sensor lying to us or not? And uh, based on the symptoms of, of uh, the owner and the long crank time and the poor miles per gallon, um, the chances of this sensor being bad are slim to none. Uh, and now that the O2 is actually fluctuating, is going to tell me that this O2 is actually functional and not stuck. So you have to always be concerned about an O2 that would uh, be fixed rich being a bad O2 sensor. But this O2 is moving up and down now. A little bit on the fuel trims, we're minus 50, minus 60. That's the, the highest I've ever seen on a short term, or lowest if you want to call it that. Long term starting to counter, and that's going to try to bring this short term back into a normal range. Uh, fuel trim's kind of funny. I'll have to do a, a video on on understanding these numbers, but very briefly, the short term's job, number one, is to keep the O2 moving back and forth across stoichiometric, and the long term's job is, is to keep this short term near zero. So as this car runs, this number is going to count down, and it's going to bring this number back up more towards zero. But this is definitely a severely rich condition. There's a couple other tests you could do to confirm it. You could put a probe in the tailpipe and look at your CO percentage. Uh, we could also um, do some vacuum leak testing on the O2 for response, but again, not necessary because this O2 is moving. So I'm going to believe this O2 and we're going to attack a rich condition for this vehicle. So the next thing we're going to do based on these numbers is we're going to look at our fuel pressure. All right, so I've adapted a fuel pressure gauge to this engine. and. Um, I want to cover real quick a safety concern anytime you're adapting a fuel pressure gauge to a fuel rail. Uh, fortunately, GMs, they provide a Schrader valve that's a direct screw-on type fitting. But the thing about this is this fitting uh, is right next to the distributor. And what we don't want to do is start the car right now because you always want to make sure that your fuel pressure gauge is not leaking when you connect it. You know, the O-rings deteriorate, and uh, certainly we don't want to catch this car on fire if that fuel was spraying out of that and spraying right on the distributor cap. So can you cycle the key for me a couple times? When we cycle the key, what that's going to do is that's going to run the fuel pump for one to two seconds for its prime. Now, before you do it, GMs, you can't just turn the key off and back on rapidly. You have to give the computer a chance to power down. So key off for about five seconds and then go ahead and turn the key back on and we should get a prime.
key back on. Good, I could hear the pump run and I can see my fuel pressure gauge climbing. Let's see if I get a shot of that. All right, turn the key back off. Wait for five seconds. Turn the key back on. All right, so we'll go back to that gauge in a second. My main concern is to make sure that my fuel pressure gauge is not leaking right where the connection is and it's not. So I'm comfortable running the vehicle now. Safety issue, make sure you guys do that. All right, while I'm here and I have this particular design, I wanna show you something else you can do with GMs as far as fuel pressure. And uh, there's a uh, little cap that goes over this power distribution center right here. So you pop this cap off, and then, then what you have is, is some hot uh, wires right here. This is hot all the time. These are all of our fusible links. But right here next to it is a connector that doesn't go anywhere. And this connector is a fuel pump test connector that's used on GM vehicles. And uh, I mentioned this in my fuel system electrical circuit design video, so you guys can watch that video at another time. But what I'm going to use this for in this application, I'm going to jump direct 12 volts to this, and that's going to manually run the fuel pump. And that's another way that you can prime the system and look for leaks, and it's what we're going to be doing later with where this video is going to take us. But what you use to do it, I'm just using a fuse jumper wire. Make sure you use a fuse jumper wire because if you connect this up, and then you're crawling underneath the vehicle, say checking pump powers or grounds. Um, just a safety measure in case this wire would touch ground, you don't want to catch it on fire. So definitely a fuse jumper wire. And connect to any one of these studs, they're hot all the time. And uh, watch the fuel pressure gauge, I'll zoom you in on this in a second, but when I jump this, a uh, little bit of arcing is okay, because the pump's actually going to turn on. Watch the gauge. And so what I'm doing right now is I'm manually running the pump. And um, it, it's helpful for your wide open throttle presser, which would be uh, the, the same thing as no vacuum, which right now with the pump running <clears throat> on this fuel pressure regulator, we're reading our wide open throttle presser. And our wide open throttle presser on this vehicle looks like about 62 PSI, which is pretty, pretty standard for this vehicle. 62 to 65, somewhere in that range. The spec is actually 55 to 65, but I've seen them run a few pounds under that. Um, pretty common. So the pump's running right now. I'm looking for leaks. I don't see any. That's great. Now the other thing we can do while we're here is we check a vehicle for a bleed down problem. On fuel systems, fuel pressure should hold on shutdown. And as you can see by the pressure gauge, can you see it dropping in that video? Is it close enough? Yeah that fuel pressure dropping on this vehicle, we are on the right track for the symptoms with this. This is the GM CPI system, that central port injection. Um, it's known in the field as the spider injector assembly. Uh, that's not the technical name for it. They just call it that because it looks like a spider. And these are known for ruptured pressure regulators that cause the symptoms we have for this vehicle. Our symptoms are a rich condition, we got negative fuel trim numbers, we have a rich exhaust code, PO 172, we got a rough idle, and we have poor miles per gallon. Everything is matching here for this ruptured diaphragm, which is what we think is going on. Um, I'm gonna crank the engine now, and uh, we'll get a look at this with it running. Probably going to get a long crank time now that I had that running. Good. Alright, so with the car running, we got about about 55, 56 PSI, that's a normal fuel pressure reading for the engine idling. 
Uh, the other thing you'd want to do for fuel pressure on this vehicle is you want to do a snap throttle test and you watch your gauge. During the acceleration of the engine, the fuel pressure should rise. During the deceleration, it will fall below the idle spec. And so, you saw on a snap throttle, we saw the same thing we saw with the key on engine off where we were manually energizing the pump. And that was about 62 PSI wide open throttle. I'm gonna do it again. We hit about 62 one more time. So those are good fuel pressure readings for this vehicle. Um, a, our cause of our rich condition certainly is not too high of fuel pressure for this car or this truck. Um, that's how you would do your fuel pressure check. Our main problem is this, watch. I shut this key off, this should hold. Now on these designs, uh, there's some numbers that you wanna go by. And um, the numbers I use as far as a pressure drop would be, you don't want any more than say a five PSI drop in 20 minutes. Um, and that's a number I read off of one vehicle. I don't think that applies to all of them, but the point with fuel pressure and bleed down is it should hold on shutdown. Now it won't hold forever. If you left the fuel pressure gauge on a car overnight, it would be absolutely normal for that gauge to be down at zero by the time you came out the next morning. It needs to hold for a period of time, in particular during the hot soak of the engine. When you shut the engine off and there's a lot of temperature and heat under the hood, that pressure needs to hold to keep the fuel from boiling in the fuel rail. So when you have a bleed down problem like we have, you're gonna have long crank times. Now in the case of, of this one, not only do we have a long crank time, but we have rich conditions as well. And, and what I wanna do now is to show you how to be 100% confident that our next step on this vehicle is we're gonna have to remove the intake plenum, and that's this guy over here, and get access to this CPI unit. So we don't want to remove the intake unless we're 100% sure that we have to go in there. Because there's a few other things that will give us bleed down problems. You could have a fuel pump check valve that's leaking and back feeding into the tank on shutdown. That problem, however, would not cause a rich condition. It would only give you long crank times. There's another cause of a bleed down and that would be the regulator inside that would be dumping on the return line. So in other words, the regulator seat area doesn't seal well. And again, that particular problem, long crank time, not a rich condition. The third one that'll give us long crank times and a rich condition would be the ruptured diaphragm in the regulator or a leaking fuel injector or something leaking inside of this unit. So I'm gonna walk you through how to, again, be 100% sure that inside of that intake is where we need to go. And so what we're gonna do next is we're gonna get a couple pairs of needle nose vice grips. We're gonna locate the rubber fuel connections near the frame under the driver's door. And we're gonna pinch off these pressure lines and return lines in different order. And we're gonna watch our fuel pressure gauge to see if our bleed down problem goes away. And this is how you address a fuel system rest pressure problem. I have this in my book under uh, fuel pressure testing, it's a section in my book that we address too low of pressure, too high of pressure, and then also a bleed down problem. So you guys that have my book, you can refer to that page um, as we're talking about it. I'll get you that page number here in a second. Okay, it's section 16 in my book. It's called titled Fuel Pressure Testing, and it's on page eight, the procedure we're about to do uh, the title of page eight says fuel system rest pressure testing. Okay, to give you guys a little bit of perspective of where I am, I'm, I'm right under the driver's door. Uh, this is the, the frame of the car right here. And here's the fuel filter. And what I'm looking at on, on these GMs on the, on the S10s is the three fuel lines and they're right here. Um, there's one right here, there's one right here, and there's one here. Now the middle one that has no fittings on it, that's a vapor line. I'm not worried about the vapor line, that's part of the EVAP system. 
And so the difficult part is identifying which one is your pressure line and which one's the return line. And it's very easy when you have the fuel filter by you is you look at the line that comes out of the fuel filter and it's tough to get this camera in here to show you but it is clearly that line right there and so now I know that this is my pressure line and that the line above that up here this is my return line and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a pair of ice grips and I'm going to pinch this off I uh, want to warn you guys that you don't want to pinch off fuel lines if they're plastic and you don't want to pinch off fuel lines if they're braided steel um, a rubber fuel connection is perfectly fine so I'm going to pinch this off and then I'm going to recheck my bleed down and I'm going to pinch this one off up here and recheck the bleed down problem so um, if the car still leaks with both of these pinched off individually the next thing I'll do is I'll cycle the key get my pressure back up and I'll pinch them both off at the same time and that's going to be our final confirmation on whether or not we got to pull the intake off so can you hand me a pair of ice, a pair of ice grips? And what I'm going to do is uh, um, I'm actually going to take you back up front and show you the pressure, the pressure um, gauge. But I'm just going to take these, these vice grips here. And it's kind of hard to do one-handed while I'm filming. And I'm going to take this pressure line and I'm going to pinch it off, obviously tighter than that. But I can't do it right now because what I need to do is repressurize the system and then pinch it off as soon as I shut the pump off. So I'm gonna take you up front, just so you guys know what I'm doing back here. Um, I'm gonna take you up front and show you the pressure gauge. All right, so I'm back up front, and uh, this is where it's really helpful to know how to manually energize a GM fuel pump. And again, I'm gonna use this adapter over here in the corner. I'm jumping direct battery voltage to it. You can watch the pressure gauge in the, in the picture, and uh, it's not critical that you see the numbers right now. It's critical that you watch the gauge for a bleed down, so I'm going to pressurize it. And as soon as I let this go, I'm going to have one of my helpers here uh, pinch off the pressure line. Okay, I'm letting off. Go ahead, pinch the pressure line. All right, pump is not running. Press, pressure line is pinched off, and you can see that my fuel gauge um, is dropping very rapidly still. And so what that means is our fuel pump check valve in the tank is fine and that our pump check valve leaking is not a concern anymore uh, with the pressure line pinched off. So we still have a bleed down problem. Next thing we're gonna do is go to the return line, take the pressure line pinched off, take the vice grips off the pressure line, good. And I'm gonna repressurize and when I tell you I want you to pinch the return line off for me, okay? All right. So running the pump again, bring it back to my system pressure, letting off, go ahead and pinch it. All right, and that's with the return line pinched off. So if my return line is pinched off, it's definitely not dumping back on the regulator side, return side, and with the pressure line pinched off, it's not dumping back on the pressure line. And so what that means is our drop in fuel pressure up here is definitely inside of the intake manifold. Now I know there's other ways to identify a CPI leak. You can uh, open the throttle and you know just smell for raw gas. That's what we're going to have with this one. Um, but you know I don't really like that test. I like to see something more hard evidence like this fuel pressure gauge bleed down problem. So one last test. I'm going to repressurize and what I'm going to need you to do, I want you to pinch them both off in this case. You tell me when you're ready to go. Now it's important when you do this that you don't run the pump <clears throat> with the pressure or, or return line pinched off because it's going to give you right. inaccurate results. You ready? Yep. Alright, so I'm going to pressurize the system one more time and go, go ahead and pinch them both. Both are pinched off. Yep. Alright, so with both pressure and return line pinched off, you see my pressure dropping very rapidly. That is 100% confirmation that our next step is we need to remove the upper intake and see where our fuel leak is coming from. Brandon, go ahead and leave those vice grips on back there. I'm going to come down and take a shot of what that looks like. All right, there's one pair of vice grips on the pressure line and the other pair of vice grips on the return line is up there. And you see they're both pinched off. 
and we still had a bleed down problem. So again, we're going into the intake next. All right, so now I know I'm gonna get some comments on, you know, why didn't you just um, check for hydrocarbons in the throttle body? And you can do that. You can open up the throttle plate and you can use a gas analyzer and check your hydrocarbon levels. Um, honestly, it's not necessary. This car stinks so bad like gasoline right now. Uh, just, just smelling that, that, that in itself is enough to uh, go in and do this job, but my answer to why not just use a gas analyzer and check for hydrocarbons is what's normal hydrocarbons on a good vehicle? Um, you would need to know that. So of course you're going to have some hydrocarbons in the intake because injectors will fire on shutdown and the intake valve never opens. It's going to sit there. You're going to have some hydrocarbons. So I don't like that because I don't have a good baseline on what number's good, what number's bad. Now granted, having thousands of parts per million hydrocarbons is pretty pretty good indicator, but again, just use your nose too. But of course there's more than one way to identify this problem. I prefer the fuel pressure bleed down test I just showed you. We're pulling the intake off now. All right, we got the intake off. Some other clues to look for when you have this problem is you see to the left that the intake plenum is pretty clean and to the right, it's pretty dirty. Actually, what you want to see is a dirty intake here. Uh, that's all from PCV gases and things like that. Uh, the, to the left with it being clean is an indication of a fuel leak for sure. Uh, something else I forgot to mention on this design is when you have this particular problem, um, what GM has done to prevent gasoline from building up inside of this intake manifold is they've drilled small holes in the center two cylinders on the intake runner. So what you would have is if you pull the spark plugs out, um, what you'd have in the middle cylinders is you'd have some black spark plugs. So the middle cylinders would run very rich, the plugs would be black, and, and it's another method if you pull the plugs and you find the middle cylinders uh, that the plug is black, in particular on this passenger side where this regulator is. Um, for those of you that maybe don't have a pressure gauge or uh, you know, you're looking for another method to identify, you could pull the three plugs out on this left side. Sorry, it would be the right side of the engine, but left on the screen here. And um, check your middle plug, see if it's all black compared to the outer two. But you know, I don't really like that. It's not foolproof. And that hole that's drilled is actually right there, the shiny spot um, on this middle runner. So right here is where they drill a hole into this center cylinder intake runner and that's gonna suck all the fuel into this middle cylinder so that middle cylinder runs really rich. Uh, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna change my camera angle. We're gonna zoom in on this regulator and we're going to energize our fuel pump and look for our leak. Okay, so again, uh, very helpful to know how to energize one of these fuel pumps. Uh, you could just cycle the key on and off and uh, you know, energize the pump that way, but go ahead and jump that. And you see our pressure gauge rising, that's great. Okay, let off. And let me zoom back over on the regulator and we'll get a picture of what that looks like. Okay, so I got, got you zoomed into the regulator and you can actually see fuel dripping off of that right now. Go ahead and re-energize that again. And what you wanna watch is that hole right there. All right, let it off and back on. Keep doing that a couple times on and off. That'll prime the system and really emphasize this fuel running out of here. And so you can see right here at this, this hole at the bottom of the regulator that we got fuel pouring out of there and that confirms what our call is, which is a ruptured fuel pressure regulator diaphragm. And what that hole is there for is this is actually a vacuum assist type regulator <clears throat> that has two separate pressures. You have an idle pressure, you have a wide open throttle pressure, and vacuum affects how this regulator is going to dump back to the tank. So with, with vacuum on that port, it's gonna open sooner. With no vacuum on that port, it opens later and that changes your fuel pressure. So that hole is there intentionally. This entire intake is a manifold vacuum, so we don't need a vacuum hose going to it, but it's the same characteristic as you would have on a vacuum assist type regulator, which I've showed, shown in other videos. I had one on a ruptured leaking fuel pressure regulator diaphragm, and that one wasn't nearly as bad as this one, but, but this is the same thing. Um, diaphragm ruptures, you got fuel running out of that, that port, where does it go? Fills up the intake, engine runs rich, 
O2 is going to see rich conditions, computer is going to take fuel away on the fuel trim, you're going to have a rough idle in particular because engines that idle don't need a lot of fuel and you're dumping fuel at it. The, the symptoms of this too would be the car runs good under load, no issues under load whatsoever. Um, you know, engines need to run rich under load. And uh, the other thing, we have a misfire trouble code um, and poor gas mileage. Uh, so all of this caused by this ruptured regulator. So what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to actually show you that, that you can get a part and just change the regulator rather than changing the whole unit. However, if you're going to piece one of these together like we're going to do, we want to make sure that everything else looks good. And some of the checks are going to be making sure on the other side where the fuel lines run in that we have no leaks there too. So I'm going to take you there now. Okay, another location I've seen leaks on, on these systems is this pressure and return line. These are nylon lines that come in here. This is the return line and this is the pressure line. And so what we want to make sure is we're going to re-energize again and we want to make sure that we don't have any leaks on these two guys. So can you go ahead and pressurize that? And I'll look at this closely and we'll make sure we don't have a leak here. Because I do have a clean spot down there that I don't like very much. All right, let off. I don't see any fuel leaking out of this, this line. So I think we're gonna be okay. But you wanna double check that. And these are separate. These don't come with the kit when you buy one of these injector assemblies. We're just gonna piece the regulator into this and then we're gonna repressurize when we're done and make sure that our system holds rest pressure and, and then we'll put it back together. So we're gonna pull the unit out and we're going to put the regulator in. I'll show you how we do that. And, uh, and then we'll double check it when we're done. All right, this, this part's gonna to be tough to shoot and be, be still with the camera, but there's a couple things you wanna to do to take this out. One is this clip on the side. So you're gonna take a small pocket screwdriver and you're gonna lift out on this clip. Come on, almost need two hands to do this. Take this clip off. That holds the fuel lines in. Uh, something else you want to consider if you're doing one of these is rest pressure. Uh, these are still under pressure, um, so you want to be careful, but our system having a bleed down problem, and I'm not worried about fuel spraying everywhere. Take the electrical injector connector off this rubber O-ring. We're going to re reuse that, although it's all soft from gasoline being on it. That's actually a, uh, a rubber connection for the um, electrical connector. It's not really critical, but we want to reuse that. Move this out of the way. These poppet nozzles, they have plastic clips, and what you do with these clips is you squeeze them, gently move back and forth, because we're gonna reuse this, and, and these, these will typically break. Um, I don't have any intention of changing this whole assembly, so I wanna be careful, and there's one, and that's the assembly uh, taken out. So you pinch them together and work it back and forth and uh, you know we want to reuse this on, on our design so we don't want to break them. <clears throat> as far as location goes, it doesn't matter <clears throat> which one's which because this whole assembly sprays together. They all fire at the same time. So it's not critical on which one is, is going where, but the being that they've been there for a while, all the lines have a, a uh, they're kind of molded to where they went. So you want to put them back in their same spot just so you don't crack the lines. Um, so we're going to do the same thing with the other six. We're going to take those out. And then our, our middle two fuel lines, you just want to gently pull on them. And this is our, our pressure line. They almost need another hand to do it. Um, I didn't expect fuel to come out of there, but did I get some on my camera? I sure did. Hold on. All right, dodged a bullet on that one. So it goes to show you about rest pressure. Now I'm gonna do the same thing with both of these lines, pop them out, but I wanna talk about one thing here, especially if you're, you're uh, reusing these, there's an O-ring on this line and you can see it, it's sitting right on the end of the line. It's right there. You wanna make sure that that O-ring is, uh, comes out with the line. If it doesn't, you're gonna wanna dig that O-ring out of there. I've seen people um, uh, use two O-rings when they put them back together, not realizing that there's one uh, still stuck inside of this unit. So, but that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna pop the other line off too. I can't do, do that on the camera while I'm holding it. 
Uh, we'll pop this line off. We'll continue taking the rest of these five poppet nozzles out, the injectors, and then this entire assembly lifts up out of here. Uh, of course, we're going to change this gasket, so I'm not worried about this thing. But this whole unit, when you grab it and pull on it, this whole unit comes up out of there. So that's it. That's all that holds it in there. We'll pull it out. I'll show you how to change the regulator. All right, I'll try to film this part for you guys. I don't know if I'll be able to, but I have all we have all of the um, injector poppets out. So we got all six poppets. We got both our presser and return lines off. The O-rings came out with it, which is good. Now what you do, you just grab the, the whole assembly and wiggle back and forth and lift it up out of there. Now I'm using a pretty decent amount of pressure because this has a uh, kind of an O-ring that sits in the middle of this intake. But that's it. There's your assembly. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna unbolt this regulator and we're gonna replace just the regulator. All right, so we got this unit on the bench, you know, basic uh, setup, two screws that hold it in. And here's the regulator. And uh, there's an O-ring that, that sat around this. You gotta be careful, pay attention to what you're doing. There's a spacer in there. And then there was an O-ring that went on top. And something that people miss sometimes is there's supposed to be a lower O-ring on here and it's not there. It's down inside this housing still. So you wanna be careful with that. Uh, yeah, can you hit me my pocket screwdriver? And what we wanna do is we wanna dig this O-ring out of here. You don't wanna forget, actually there's a screen here too. I forgot about the screen. So there's a screen and then here's the lower O-ring. So you wanna be careful, don't leave that in there. If we're gonna replace this, we don't wanna put two O-rings in. Uh, that would be a bad idea. So the screen goes here, and then the O-ring sat here, and that's your whole assembly. Um, so definitely be careful with the O-ring. So we're going to change this now, um, and the part that we have for it, show the part number, so you guys can do this yourself. Uh, list price on this part is what? $49.99. $49.99 was the list price on this. Um, it's actually a help um, piece. And uh, so it's uh, 55162, or is that 152? Yeah, 55162. It's a help item, GM fuel pressure regulator. And uh, this is the way it comes. You see the new screen, new O ring, upper and lower. Uh, again, important that you got that O ring out of the inside. Now, what you want to be careful with these, I've seen this before on this design, is you want to make sure, let's see if I can show this. You want to make sure before you put this in here, I had an issue with my last one and it looks like this one's going to be the same too. Yeah, so there's there's actually a manufacturer mistake here with this regulator and the last one we did we learned the hard way. And if you look at this regulator, you're, you're going to see the, the outsides of it are actually just a hair too big. So if I, if I try to push this down on there now and use the screws to do it, what's going to happen is that's going to spread these ears and it's going to snap the housing right here. So something that this manufacturer needs to know is they're making these just a little bit too big to fit in between here. Um, but that's okay. We're going to still use it. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to modify this housing just a little bit. And I'm just going to take a Dremel and I'm going to shave very... A uh, small amount of plastic um, off of this part right here and, and this part right here. Just going to take a little bit off so that fits down in there. Show you the old one. Uh, the old one, this should, this should fall right into place. And you see the diameter difference of the old one, how it's not hitting this housing at all. So a uh, little word to the help people. They, they need to redesign this thing. If you're not paying attention, you're going to crack this housing. And that's what's going on with this. So we're going to have to modify this housing to use this part. I don't know if other manufacturers make this. Uh, it's what I'm using right now. So you guys feel free to comment on whoever else makes a regulator for this that doesn't have this oops. You know, you got to pay attention to stuff like this. So, all right, I'm going to modify it and then I'll show you the pick after. All right, it's now been modified a little bit and I've just used a small file 
and I just shaved the corner down just a small amount, not much at all. Same thing on this side, shaved the corners. And so what we want is this new piece and I put a little bit of engine oil on the O-rings, helps for installation, is this should fit very snugly by hand. I wanna make sure it seats all the way and you can see that it does and that we're good. And once we put the, the bracket back on that holds it, this thing's gonna have no problem. We're not gonna crack the housing and that's gonna hold no problem at all. Show you the top view so you can see what I'm talking about. You see why you need to shave that a little bit. If you were to force that in there, um, I've done it before with this help product and it snapped the housing and that's the whole point. We're trying to save ourselves a couple hundred dollars here and uh, doing it this way. 